open house. So I'd like to begin just by thanking our events team who has really worked tirelessly for the last few months in, in putting this together. Uh, Camille Santi Steven, Ryan Case, Paul McQuiston, and Alyssa Myers. So thank you very much. And I'd also like to thank um, our sponsors uh, for their financial support. Um, a list of our sponsors are on the back of your program. So really, the objective of this, uh, this uh, um, open house is threefold. And first is really to give you an overview of the important and exciting research that is being conducted by our faculty and staff. And second is really to give you, um, to give you another overview and to showcase our, our infrastructure and resources that are available to the CUNY community and greater academic and professional community. And third is to familiarize, your, familiarize you with our, the available opportunities for collaboration with ASRC faculty and to either strengthen your existing collaborations or forge new scientific interactions. So the, the ASRC was created to investigate critical scientific and societal challenges in five disciplines, um, and these disciplines are represented across various CUNY institutions and campuses. Uh, specifically, these are nanoscience, uh, photonics, structural biology, neuroscience, and environmental science. And we're fortunate to have five or four of the five positions filled by excellent directors who will give you an overview of their science uh, shortly. And um, so, and why, why did we choose, why were these uh, specific uh, initiatives chosen? And these were really carefully selected both individually and collectively because of their interdisciplinary nature. And the rationale for bringing these, these uh, areas of research under the same roof uh, was really to enable the exchange of information between each scientific endeavor, uh, whether this be indirectly through the through the um, sharing problem-solving approaches or directly by forming research collaborations. So to facilitate these interactions, um, the building was designed with the flowing floor pattern. And as you can see, it's, it's really beautiful, the, uh, the um, ascending uh, staircase, the wide staircase. And that was really uh, designed to promote intellectual cross-fertilization between the, the uh, number of areas. But the ASRC was also meant to be a scientific resource for non-ASRC resident CUNY faculty, as well as other academic and professional entities. So we currently have six operational cores, which you'll learn more about today, as well as four that are in the planning and execution phase. And along with that, we also have a fully staffed 6,000 square foot center for comparative medicine. All of these facilities, it should be noted, were created with the input of the greater CUNY community. And they're really, they're really uh, designed to enhance the footprint and the throughput of CUNY science uh, in a global sense. Um, so it's in, in this vein that we thought it would be uh, beneficial for you to hear from some of our, our, our core facility users, um, as they really represent a microcosm of our user base. And that will take place at 520 today. We have a user panel. Uh, so hopefully some of you can join us for that as well. Additionally, we wanted to take this opportunity to, to showcase uh, some of our efforts to promote collaboration um, between CUNY campuses and the ASRC. So some of you are aware of our CUNY Affiliates Program in which the CUNY faculty are provided with resources uh, within the ASRC to foster their own research programs. And we also have a, um, a CUNY seed grant program in which CUNY and ASRC faculty mem members uh, meet up and, and come up with collaborations. And this is, this is evidenced um, in the poster session that will be taking place throughout the day. Now, these grants, while monetarily small, they're about $10,000. They really provide critical resources to help spearhead uh, new ideas and, and launch new collaborations. So we're really excited about some of the some of the things that we're doing, some of the things that have come out of these collaborations. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, we are active. We actively encourage collaborations with industry, 
when there are synergies between program research programs here and, and our industrial partnerships, and we have several ongoing and evolving industri industrial partnerships uh, that we're working on. And lastly, one of the key tenets in the founding of the ASRC is the commitment uh, to education and outreach. Um, providing excellent educational opportunities for the next generation of, of scientists is of paramount importance, not only for CUNY, but uh, the nation as a whole. And consistent with this mission, uh, we've continued to strengthen our relationships uh, with one of the nation's premier institutions in delivering high quality education in a public setting, and that's CUNY's own Graduate Center. So on that note, um, I'd like to, it's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed partner and the president of the Graduate Center, Chase Robinson. Eric, thank you very, very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. And on behalf of uh, the Graduate Center, as well as the university, I'd like to welcome you all. I'd like to thank Eric, um, whom I've gotten to know a little bit. Eric has been at the ASRC only for a few months, um, but I think the directors will join me in acknowledging what a terrific job he has done. He's, uh, he's leading a very bold and a very exciting enterprise with uh, precisely the kind of expertise um, that it requires. And so um, I'm indebted to Eric for doing the job that he's been doing. It is uh, an opportunity today to celebrate what the ASR, ASRC is, but it's also an opportunity to, um, to describe what it will become. Uh, and before I say a few words about the sciences in CUNY and the Graduate Center and the ASRC, I do want to recognize um, the presence of the Bronx City Councilman, James Vaca, who is a tireless champion of education, the environment, and equality, uh, especially for the elderly and the disabled. Why, um, why these particular interests, you might ask, of Councilman Vaca? Well, because he's a CUNY alumnus, and we expect such passions of CUNY alumni. After earning his master's degree in urban education, urban studies at Queens, he began teaching weekend and evening classes in political science and public policy and in sociology at his alma mater. What could be better testimony to uh, fidelity to, uh, uh, to, to, to CUNY and to Queens College? Now in his third term as a council member, he serves, and I think this will come as some interest to many of you, he serves as chair of the technology committee and deputy leader of the city council. We're very fortunate to have him today. So. So today is an important moment in history of, of the ASRC. It allows us an opportunity to, to be a witness, I think, to the university's extraordinary investment in the sciences, partnering as it has with the state. The Graduate Center has been uh, uh, an important partner um, all along with those investments. Let me just give you a few examples of the kind of things that we've been up to over the last two or three years. Our initiative in the theoretical sciences is creating essential and significant interactions between experimentalists and theorists across the 24 campuses that constitute CUNY. The CUNY Neuroscience Collaborative, which is based at the Graduate Center, brings together five previously separate entities and is forming a powerful and powerfully integrated training program We've invested significantly in a variety of digital initiatives, attracting CUNY 2020 grant funding that will transform part of our library into a data visualization center. And closely related to that, we're creating a number of master's degrees in data science, in data visualization and analysis, the digital humanities, and working increasingly with the university's high performance computing center. So given uh, uh, the kind of activities that we've been up to, and that's just a small sampling, um, it will come as no surprise that we've also been taking the opportunity to celebrate the enormous um, uh, uh, tradition of science 
that the university already has. Again, just two examples. Recently, we awarded distinguished alumni medals to, um, to two of our alumni, Maggie Johnson, who is a graduate uh, of the computer science PhD program at the Graduate Center. She is now the foundational, most significant figure at Google working in educational outreach from kindergarten through high school. She has been a wonderful partner with the Graduate Center in building out our commitment to bring students uh, from the most diverse and talented backgrounds into computer science. A second example, great pleasure this past spring in awarding uh, a distinguished alumni medal to Dr. Dennis Leota, a very proud graduate of our chemistry program. He has been credited with saving and extending innumerable lives. It's estimated, and, uh, and believe me, we fact check this. It's estimated that more than 90% of Americans with HIV have taken a drug of his invention. That is the scale of his significance. That's the scale, as it were, of the significance of um, the chemistry program in his career. Now, those activities have taken place within a framework, and the framework was uh, a report that I had the pleasure of writing at the Commission of the Chancellor in 2015, which prescribed specific strategies that we were to follow in order to improve the quality of PhD education in the four bench sciences, biology, chemistry, biochemistry, and physics. The point was to improve the quality of those PhD programs for the benefit of the entire system. I could not be more pleased than to report to you today that with our campus programs, and very much under leadership of Josh Brumberg, we have made uh, really signal progress on each one of those goals. So for all of those reasons and many others that I haven't mentioned, when the chancellor and the executive vice provost approached us to take responsibility for the ASRC, that is to say those of us at the Graduate Center, to bring into close collaboration the work of the ASRC with the Graduate Center so as to advance two goals, fundamental science, and at the same time acting as a catalyst for the university as a whole, well, I responded with uh, not only preparedness but also some real enthusiasm. We've already begun to integrate the ASRC into our course offerings. A good uh, evidence of that is the nanoscience laboratory course that's offered here in Upper Manhattan. We envision many, many such collaborations. We, uh, we very much look forward to working closely with our partners here. It is a natural partnership and a logical extension of what the ARC, ASRC has been all about. The goal, as I said a moment ago, is to benefit science and science education in the city, in the country, and more fundamentally, scientific discovery. Allow me uh, a moment here in my closing remarks to allude to the times in which we live. I think the timing of this partnership is auspicious. Emphasis on the sciences has never been more urgent or necessary, especially in what some are labeling with, it must be said, some unnerving frequency, a post-fact world. Higher education, and I've spoken of this on many occasions, is a noble project for many reasons. At its best, and that's what we're doing here at the ASRC, it cultivates skepticism, it cultivates criticism, it even cultivates dissent. It's critical not just to the ongoing project of building our economy, but also in building just, equitable, and democratic societies. That is the kind of passion that we at the Graduate Center and our colleagues here at the SRC bring to our work. So, enjoy the afternoon. 
you will learn a great deal about the enormous talent that, uh, that, that is already here at the ASRC, amongst the directors, amongst their colleagues, amongst our students, and I hope to see you many, many more times in the future. Thank you very much. And now we can get to the part that, uh, that you all are here for, introducing our, our directors and going over some of our scientific direction. So I w you've already heard enough from me, so um, it's without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Ryan Uline. Um, he came to us a few years ago. We were able to lure him from the University of Strathclyde, where he was a full professor and later the, the vice dean for research. And we're really excited to have him here. And he's put together a really excellent and exceptional um, a nanoscience team. So, Ryan. Thank you, Eric. And thank you, Chase, for those, those wonderful words. And we are equally delighted about this partnership. It's going to be, I think, very exciting. It comes at a really good time for us also. Um, so welcome, everybody. Um, it's great to see so many people here, I th many familiar faces. I think also some people who haven't been before. Um, can we just raise hands of who's been before? OK, so that's maybe about half. Welcome back. Glad you, um, I guess you enjoyed your first visit or your previous visits. And it's great that you found it worthwhile to come back. And people who haven't been before, welcome. And, and, and I think this is going to be hopefully, uh, hopefully will we'll, we'll, we'll impress you today, because that's our idea. I think we have a, a wonderful story to tell. We've been going um, in nanoscience for two years now. Um, and um, I'm extremely proud of what we've achieved uh, so far. Um, I, the best stuff is ahead of us. There's no question about that. But I, I, I wanted to uh, briefly um, take the opportunity to talk you through what we have done uh, so far and where we are. And, and we are very much um, about the CUNY mission. Uh, we're about people. We're about uh, providing opportunities at all levels. But we're also very much about high end, the highest end uh, science Excellent. So um, let me see. Do I just use this to get to the? No. There we go. So this is the nanoscience team, um, which is um, I'm I'm uh, is is complete uh, now. These are the uh, the 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 faculty and the um, the core facility manage managers that we've uh, been able to hire. And I would like to uh, say a few words about why we uh, recruited these people. And, um, and I really encourage you to speak with them. They're all around. And I, you know, what I say is, is one thing, but it's, uh, they're highly engaging people and you know, uh, looking for collaborations and talking about the research. But I, I want to quickly um, just uh, put them in the, in the spotlight one by one. So, so our first um, recruit here, does this, this have a... Uh, well, it's actually easy. There's two females on, in the picture. One of them, many of you will probably recognize, is a, is a Harvard professor, Joanna Eisenberg, who is still at Harvard. We've not, been, uh, we've not recruited her here, but she's on our advisory board. Um, in the middle of the picture is uh, Elisa Riedo, who we, we were lucky enough to, um, to uh, recruit from Georgia Tech. Uh, Elisa is an outstanding uh, physicist. She brings to the ASOC an ability to pattern um, uh, chemical functionality at the nanoscale, which is um, important for many uh, different types of applications in photonics, memory devices, but also uh, to interface with biology. And, uh, and again, the details, it's best to speak with her, uh, but she does this extremely well. To give you some examples, uh, she's already published uh, three nature level journals um, since joining us. Um, just over a year ago uh, with ASOC uh, as her affiliation. So that's incredible. She also is the only person I know who has a 100% track record of getting her grants funded. So every grant she's been, she submitted, and it's not just one, there's a whole bunch of grants she su submitted from the ASOC and they all got funded. I guess it will stop at one point, but it's very, very impressive and exciting. So um, then on, on your uh, on your very left is Adam Braunschweig, who joined us uh, a few months ago from the University of Miami. 
Now, Adam works on an area of nanotechnology that involves organic chemistry, um, organic nanotechnology, if you like, and the idea of using molecules to make materials with very high precision, where the, the, the building blocks dictate the functionality of the materials that are produced. Uh, we felt that this was a good idea. We were not the only people who felt this was a good idea. In fact, his PhD advisor uh, was the Nobel laureate, uh, one of the three Nobel laureates in, in chemistry this year, Sir Fraser Stoddard. So uh, that's a bit of glamour, I guess, added to what we do. But Adam, Adam is, is unique in that he, he applies this uh, knowledge to, to um, areas such as photonics and neuroscience. So he's a, a great addition to our team. Um, then in the in the middle, well, you can see me. It's not me, but the other guy in the, in the kind of in the middle. That's uh, that's uh, Shi Chen, who who joined us from Columbia University. He is a mechanical engineer, um, <laughs> and he would be able to fix the lights probably. Um, <laughs> and and she has an incredibly exciting uh, research program that's focused on. Uh, deriving energy from evaporation processes. So just think about day-night cycles. Evaporation uh, is is happening all the time in a cyclic way, and he gets um, he he der uh, derives energy from this. Um, so again, I would encourage you to speak with him. He was a Blavatnik Award finalist this year, so he's he's, he's a top-notch scientist. The other three um, uh, in the in the photograph are uh, Tyler Lee. Um, uh, who uh, manages our surface science suite, and I encourage you to go and have a look at the surface science suite. He's also a, an accomplished uh, scientist with interest in, in uh, dynamic polymers found in biology. Um, then we have uh, Tong on the very right-hand side, Tong Wang, um, who, um, is a, um, uh, who, who runs our imaging suite and is a DNA nanotechnologist who came from, uh, from NYU uh, for his PhD, uh, well-known work by Ned Seaman that will be familiar to many of you. And then Jacob Trevino um, is really responsible for one of the, the absolute uh, diamonds in this story. Very early on, he, he built single-handedly the nanofab, which is now known as the, the area's best um, um, and, uh, nanofab facility, uh, with about 300 users on, on every um, uh, every day for many different institutions. I realize I'm going a little bit too slow, so I'm going to speed up massively now. Um, you've seen the building, and um, what I just wanted to point out here is the, the, the scales issue that I think others will speak about also. Um, what is interesting in a building like this is that we take cross-disciplinarity to really new levels. If you see the scale bar, that's of course not the scale bar representing the size of this building. It's a big building, but it's not that big. But um, you can see nanoscience, photonic structure, biology, neuroscience, environmental science, ultimately covering 15 orders of magnitude. And this can come down to you know, people on our floor interested in the properties of water at the nanoscale, translating all the way up to the properties of water as the impact on, 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 on global climate issues as they are studied on the, on the top floor. So we have unique opportunities to bring people together to do some new science. This is just a little bit showing off. I mean, we don't get that opportunity very often, but as I said, I'm extremely proud of what we've, we've done. You see some upward curves here. People-wise, we, we, we moved in with three people in this gigantic building um, two years ago. On na in Nano, we're, we're up to 42 and still uh, rapidly increasing. Total awards, we're bringing in money from the, the variety of, of sources. Uh, so within Nano, we're up to just over 3 million. And uh, the, the graph on the very right is the, 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 the grants that are going in. And this, this is on financial year. So we're halfway through uh, 2017 in terms of financial year. So as you can see, there's a steep upward trajectory, which will uh, continue. Um, uh, so we, we, we have partnerships, um, which is one key thing for us. We, we want to be a hub within this city, and we have strong partnerships with Columbia, NYU, uh, the medical, um, uh, biomedical-focused institutions on, the, on, the, on First Avenue. Um, and uh, yeah, publication highlights, I mean, we have published uh, incredibly well. We can compete with anybody right now with just four faculty. We are, I think we are punching well above our weight, and I'm very very proud of that and of my, my colleagues. Um, I think I'm going to, given the time, uh, uh, not um, 
dwell here. I'm very happy to speak with people about the details. The top areas focus uh, the, the, the areas of nanoscience that we've, we've identified as strengths for CUNY. So not just within the SOC, but strengths where we can use the SOC as a catalyst to achieve more for our, our colleagues around the system. And those areas are nanomaterials, uh, nanobio interfaces. Again, I refer to the, uh, the First Avenue corridor where there's many collaborators of, of ours and uh, nano devices. And just one example there, we are involved in a very large, um, I think it's an $18 million um, a proposal that's, that's one step away from being funded with Columbia and Harvard and, and, and us. So, so I think that, that shows you who we are um, working with. Um, the three areas below, those are our cores, and, you, and I encourage you to, to visit those. Um, I would encourage people, especially professors, students, to get involved. This is not our building, actually. It's your building. Uh, please come and use it. Take advantage of it. We have many mechanisms to do this. Um, the partnership with the GC will allow us to uh, enhance uh, the offerings in graduate training. We have um, uh, affiliate schemes, seed grants, etc. Eric already referred to this. If you want to know more, please talk to us about it. Um, we have had a number of highly successful symposia. There will be more um, uh, where we involve CUNY colleagues and, and, and colleagues from, uh, from uh, around the city. Um, partnerships, I think industrial is now going to be very important for us to, to get the, uh, the industrial people on board and, and, and also our partnerships with the, the private uh, academic institutions in the city are already pretty mature and that's going incredibly well. Um, we're involved in large grants, strategic grants. If you want to get involved, want to know more, uh, talk to us. Uh, sign up for Nano News. That's not ARCC, why that's the Nano side. We have a, um, we, we have a, a newsletter that, where we share all our good news um, on a quarterly basis. So with that, I, I'm sorry I went slightly over, but I really wanted to share this with you. Um, I'm going to now hand over to my, my, my colleague and actually now very good friend since we've done so much together, um, Kevin Gardner um, from um, uh, Structural Biology. Kevin. Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to see some old friends and regular visitors to the ASRC, and it's even better to see many people who I haven't had the chance to meet yet and tell you a little bit about the work that we're doing on the third floor, which is structural biology. I appreciate the audience is diverse. Some of you are in areas far away from where we are, so I wanted to give a one-slide introduction to what structural biology is. Fundamentally, we're interested in the shapes of the machines of the cell at the nanoscale, such as Ryan introduced in his talk, but then understanding how these teach us about the function of those devices that evolution has produced, and in so doing so, we understand how biology and medicine work today in 2016. We understand how disease breaks some of these machines, and we understand how to engineer them into new tools that enable new studies over, for example, in neuroscience or in other fields beyond that. Two examples of the work that you would see if you come onto the floor are wonderful things at the intersection of physics, chemistry, and biology. For example, Amade de Georges, who is an assistant professor on the floor and a member of the chemistry and biochemistry department at City College, uses advanced cryo-electron microscopy methods to understand how the gates that control whether or not your heart cells let calcium in or out are properly controlled. This requires using very high-end machinery, very high-end tools, very advanced electron microscopes, such as we have available downstairs, to be able to image these receptors and understand how they work. My group takes a look at how various organisms sense blue light. And in doing so, we understand not only the shapes of a piece of a molecule that a plant outside right now is using to track the sun and know whether it should be using photosynthesis by day or shutting itself down at night, and learning how to evolve that into new tools that allow us to know, now go into human cells, into cancer cells, 
turn genes on and off or be able to get a cell to move around and follow a, a blip of laser light like it's smelling something that it wants to eat. These tools only come about, and these understanding of diseases in these areas only come about, in our opinion, because we understand the shape. We understand how these devices work. And it's been wonderful over the past two years that we've been operating to work with many of you, hearing about similar systems of interest to you in different areas of biology, biochemistry, cell biology, and other fields, and thinking about ways that we can work together to put them to good use. Great. Our mission is pretty simple. We're here to be a resource for CUNY in four different ways. We're here to recruit, develop, and retain fantastic people, everywhere from faculty that we have on the floor, and we're currently halfway through our proposed recruiting with two of the four of us present, more on that in the next slide, but it also includes technicians. It includes outstanding people that all of you can work with who run our core facilities. It includes places for students to come work. We want to cultivate an environment of research excellence. As with Ryan's floor, it's been a great year for us. First author publications in Cell, inner author publications at Nature, novel compounds entering phase two clinical trials for a variety of renal cell cancers. The accomplishments here are fantastic, but they don't stay within the walls of our own groups. We're the kind of place that wants to be able to be a meeting place for people in the structural biology and biochemistry communities more broadly. And we do that with annual symposia or weekly seminars that I would argue are among some of the best in the city in this field. Number three, it's our job to put the right tools together to be able to get this kind of work to happen. If you're trying to study the structure of something that's only a few atoms across, you can't do this by going onto eBay and going and buying a, a magnifying glass. We need the tools of electron microscopy. We need NMR spectroscopy. We need synchrotron rings located at national labs to go do X-ray diffraction experiments. Some of that work happens right here in this building, one floor below us. Some of it happens next door at the New York Structural Biology Center that CUNY is a proud partner of. And some of it happens elsewhere in the country, but it all starts by great ideas launched here in the building and in many of your labs working together with us. And finally, number four really addresses that. Having the right people and having wonderful equipment would all be nice in some regards, but it only really shows what it can do if it enables an experiment that right now is a thought in the back of your head or is maybe something that you haven't yet come up with. If we can help turn that idea into reality and help get results discovered here in CUNY that we wouldn't have seen otherwise. So let's go through just in quick, quick passing some of these things in a little more detail. So I come from a school of thought where people are the most important part to any of this. And none of this would be worthwhile doing for me if we didn't have, thank you, if we didn't have a, a great team assembled. That includes Amade de George, who I mentioned before, Jim Aramini and Renat Absalmoff, who run our core facilities in biomolecular NMR and mass spec, and Bruce Johnson, who brings 20 years plus worth of experience over in, in big pharma and industry to help us understand novel ways to develop computational tools to collect, interpret, and analyze some of the information that we're getting out of our high-end biophysics experiments. Those of you who will be joining us on some of our core tours after the words can, some, can see some of the instrumentation we have on the first floor or the ground floor, for example, over in NMR spectroscopy. We have top-notch mass spectrometry up on three, and then working together with the imaging core that nanoscience has put together top-end uh, electron microscopy. And finally, I'd really be remiss if I didn't note that we here at the ASRC are a very concrete CUNY presence in what I would argue is one of the best blocks in the entire United States for this field. Between what we have as a CUNY-wide resource here at uh, the ASRC, the City College Center for Discovery and Innovation right next door, and then the New York Bi Structural Biology Center, a nine-institution consortium of structural biologists, including both public and private institutions. This block represents well over a $100 million investment and arguably about 50 research labs working on a regular basis in this field. This is a wonderful area to be working in. I'd argue there's no better, better place to do so than what we've got right here at 133rd Street in Harlem. I'll close by finishing that again. We're not just looking to do this solely for ourselves. We actively engage people in the community through annual symposia, through weekly seminars, and one thing we've heard from many of you, especially those of you who are joining us remotely from places well outside Manhattan, 
you want to be able to be part of this without necessarily taking the time and effort out of your schedules to be able to come and visit us in person. We welcome that, and we're streaming this event along with many others in our field. So I'll be available, as will many of the people you saw on these slides and our team through the day. We're glad to discuss ways that we might be able to work together. With that, let me turn the floor over to Patrizia Katsatia, who's our Director of Neuroscience, formerly trained in the field uh, with uh, stops at both Cornell and NYU. Uh, we were lucky enough to be able to recruit her here earlier this year from Mount Sinai, where she retains her clinical appointment. Patricia, you have the floor. So thank you so much for coming today to this um, wonderful event. I just, uh, since we are just starting, most of our presentation is going to be what we intend to do, what we want to create, and how we are envisioning this, this mission. So this is the ASRC, life at the ASRC as of now, right? So we have the fifth floor with the Crossroad Initiative at a level of kilometer scale, right? I mean, Charlie, as we will hear uh, later, really works on the environment and uh, on several of these uh, critical challenges. On the other hand, we heard from Ryan and Kevin that we have nanometer scales, molecular level. So there was really a gap, as you can see in the middle, and this is the gap that we intend to fill with the Neuroscience Initiative. I really specifically like this picture because it encompasses the complexity of the human brain, one billion cells that are present, and the simplicity of the DNA, a simple double-stranded with a sequence. And this is what we really want to understand. We try to understand how does the DNA gets expressed, gets modified, to generate this critical complexity. And uh, this is my great team. Many of them are coming uh, with us to, today. I'll just show you the uh, expansion in the summer. Usually, we also host several undergraduate students. And, uh, uh, and this is the, the, the group that came, you know, will come with me in the fall of 2016. And I just included Sarah Moyon at the end because she was taking the picture and I felt it was a little bit unfair of leaving her out of the photo. <laughs> but once again, I'm just showing you again the brain and our genome-wide study. We really work on the epigenome, which is the way that the environment can influence the expression on genes without necessarily changing the sequence. So as a main theme of the initiative, what we really want to understand is how does the environment control brain health and disease? And you can see this. Environment can be microenvironment, really at the nanoscale level, where we can really work with mechanical forces, we can work with polymers, and we can look at specific outcomes. We can work with sensors with, with, uh, and, and understand how these uh, specific uh, area of normal development, such as developing new myelin or glial tumors, may occur. But we also work at the human level with patients and at the animal level using mice. And we are studying in the effect of number of variables on this organism level, including age, diet, geographic location, the effect of therapy in patients with multiple sclerosis, but also effect of exposure to plasticizer on other toxin, as well as effect of social isolation and other um, models of depression. So if this is our environmental challenge to the cell or the organism, what's the response that we look at? And our response is quite broad. We are very interested in metabolomics. We are very interested in understanding how the gut and the brain cross talk to each other. So we have a lot of emphasis also on the microbiota. And many of those changes that we understand and we try to address have critical implications, not just for neurological disorders, but also for several psychiatric disorders, including um, anxiety and depression. So this is really, in a nutshell, the type of work that we can do from the organism and mice to cells. And what you can appreciate in the two panels on the right side are two photon imaging of transgenic live mice, a technology that we do intend to bring here at the DSRC. So we really go from the organism to cell. 
And what becomes critical at this point uh, is uh, to generate single cells, create purified uh, cells population from this complexity of the brain, these billion cells. How can we do that? Well, as you will see um, also in some of the other demonstration, we are using microfluidics devices. Uh, we will work together with uh, fluidimes to really try to generate uh, single cell isolation with specific platforms. And we are happy to discuss it further. And then we really want to go from cells, and we mostly work on neurons and oligodendrocytes, to chromatin and then to DNA. But if you can see, and we will discuss at length with uh, GLU about uh, the other facility that we intend to create, which is the epigenetic core facility, to help people on campus to really work on how to isolate chromatin, how to generate uh, um, experiments that can address specific questions. But genes serve the function of generating proteins, and proteins have functions. And this is critical then to understand for us how this function is uh, um, modified. And, and this is another component of the facilities that we intend to create here, how to study neuronal bioenergetics and how to study behavior and diseases. So in a nutshell, this uh, video depicts the work of um, our group for the past 20 years, where you can see the brain of a child, you can see the blood vessels, the complexity of the neurons, and these little cells that you see are oligodendrocyte progenitors. We zoom in into the nucleus, we see a lot of the molecules moving, but we really arrive at this level of the DNA, at the level of the gene and the DNA, where we, what we detect is clearly that there are multiple components that are affecting the, the structure of the DNA itself, they can modify the molecule, they can open or close it, and all of these results then in specific changes that will impact the formation of chromatin, and the organization of the nucleus itself. And you, what you can depict here is that this enlarged, there are several of these molecules that eventually will lead to chromatin condensation and selective myelination. We can then study this event in the developing brain. We can study this event during aging. We can study this event in response to specific changes that, uh, we can, to which we can expose the organism. So based on this concept, the epigenetic core that we will be managed by, by GLU will uh, um, have several of the technology to address most of these changes that we want uh, uh, to address, including fluorescence activity cell sorter, single cell analysis using microfluidics, chromatin isolation and nucleic acid quantification. And we have been working and we are working to create partnership with several institutions. We have already established a partnership with, uh, uh, for CRISPR technology with Sigma, and we are in discussion with the New York Genome Center to try to address partnership in terms of sequencing. And in terms of the single cell technology with Fluidime, that's called also to be represented today. The, the second uh, um, facility is going to be the live imaging and bioenergetic core, and the manager is uh, Yehe, both Gia and Ye are, are here. In, in this case, we are really going to have multiple layers of imaging to address uh, at the molecular, subcellular, cellular, and organism level different modalities of imaging. And this is going to be critical, especially for what we heard from Kevin. We will be able to use specific sensors to monitor, monitor the molecule from the cell, from the cell to the live animal. And also in this case, we have created a partnership with, with Zeiss, and we are in the process of working with Agilent Technology. And finally, I would like to mention a very important critical facility, which is uh, the acquisition of uh, the Siemens Prisma. This is uh, really an effort that the ASRC is placing together with the community. This is just an example of the um, Prisma 3T. And also in this case, uh, the partnership that we intend to create with the community for the Child Mind Institute, where we want to study the, the brain of healthy developing children. And so in conclusion, just uh, to reiterate the concept that uh, Eric mentioned before, at the ASRC we have several missions, right? We have the mission of uh, address critical societal challenges, and uh, this is part of what we intend to do by studying the environment, encourage interdisciplinary research and scholarship, working both across the floors and with the other campuses, and finally, really promote community engagement and uh, address student learning. And in this case, the partnership with GC would be really uh, exciting. 
And with this, I would like to introduce uh, our next door neighbor, actually our upper neighbor, who is uh, the, um, Charlie Voros Marty. Charlie uh, was hired in 2008, has been the first occupant of the ASRC. He comes from University of New, of New Hampshire, and he has had a complex training in um, earth system science, biology, and engineering. He's a member of several national and international science steering committees, from water to Arctic and sustainable development. Charlie. In fact, I've uh, been here, uh, at least at the City College campus, and um, helping to plan ASRC uh, back from 2008. And so I had a front row seat uh, to basically the uh, planning as well as the actual construction of the building. And uh, other um, directors take note, I came here without a beard. Um, I had enough time to grow a beard, and perhaps you can join in my footsteps. Patricia, you're excluded from that challenge. Um, so let me give you a, a very quick bird's eye view of what um, we've been up to and what uh, we plan to be involved in in terms of the fifth floor, uh, which we like to say is the coolest floor in the building. It certainly has the best view in the building, and we hope that everyone uh, manages to get up to the fifth floor and, uh, and visit our facility. Um, first of all, as, uh, as our, my other directors have said, it's all about the people in our, um, in our group, and we are now fleshing out the, um, the uh, faculty members that will be joining us. We will be having three faculty members, a senior hire, Peter Groffman, who's already on staff. He's a soil microbiologist. It uh, appears as though we're going to be making investments in people who can do aquatic genomics. Uh, as well as the metabolism of urban areas, and I'll show you what that's about uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, we have a mission statement, and our mission statement is very broad. It's somewhat perhaps even abstract, very idealistic, uh, perhaps not very different than the mission statement, which is basically to save the world through environmental science that you might see in many other centers. However, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find a niche where we can go beyond uh, long and somewhat abstract dialogues and actually begin to get real with uh, state-of-the-art uh, instrumentation and a quantitative assessment of the state of the planet and where humans are taking that, that planet. Uh, this, I guess, is the third in a long line of such scaling uh, images. And um, I have found it particularly challenging but also extremely rewarding to be sitting with my other directors who are perfectly comfortable with test tubes and all sorts of uh, nano-associated devices, looking at the smallest of space and time scales. And yet I'm perfectly comfortable to be working at the global scale. And I have to correct you, Ryan, I think it's 16 orders of magnitude. Because um, I'm working at 10 to the seventh meters, not 10 to the fifth meters. So you'll have to change your slide. But what's interesting about our dialogue is that we're trying to find common ground. And as we begin to articulate what the Environmental Sciences Group is all about and what uh, my other colleagues are, are working on, we find that the common space, at least in logarithmic domains, is the, human, is the human body. So about 10 to the first meters, as right in the middle of what I am very comfortable studying and what they're very comfortable studying. And we've had a series of very interesting, stimulating, and enlightening um, dialogues about how we find this meeting ground. Um, we will be instrumenting our laboratory space. We'll have an advanced laboratory for what we call the chemical and isotopic signatures, in particular of how humans are changing the chemistry of the planet, how we're changing the chemistry of cities, how living in cities changes life uh, for ourselves and the other organisms that live in the city. And we're going to be throwing some pretty sophisticated hardware at this uh, particular set of questions. We have plans to instrument large urban areas, and one of our uh, new faculty hires will be in the business of trying to understand the metabolism of the city. That requires deploying uh, many different kinds of environmental sensors, and we'll have a sensor uh, development laboratory that'll be uh, on the fifth floor to develop state-of-the-art advanced instrumentation and environmental surveillance systems. As part of that, we anticipate uh, the role of citizen science, and through the revolution of telecommunications and micro sensor systems, we anticipate strapping up 
citizens of New York with these uh, different sensing systems, perhaps uh, a badge-like system or a, a cell phone mounted set of sensors. And so as they vector through the space and time of the city, we'll be able to integrate their comings and goings in environmental space and integrate that information into basically a four-dimensional vision of how humans are interacting with their environment in the city. And when I say four dimensions, I mean X, Y, and Z, plus time. It's the fourth dimension. As part of this um, whole analysis system, we have to be thinking about analytics. And as I'm sure most of the people in this room know, we, we're in a revolution of big data. The way we look at big data is we attempt to look at the geophysical world with now the social world. And through all of these uh, amazing data sets that you see either Twitter feeds uh, or telecommunication networks, or analysis of social systems, we have new toolkits in which we can really begin to look under the hood of the city, not only in terms of what its architecture is or what its physics is, uh, but also what its chemistry is and what its life forms are doing, in particular how humans are interacting uh, in the city. How are they going to behave under a climate-changed world? What happens if we have many, many more uh, outbreaks of, uh, of heat waves, as, as anticipated by all of the uh, the, the modeling uh, exercises that I've seen coming out of the international climate change community, what will that do to us? Uh, certainly working with the neurobiologists and the chemists in the, in the uh, organization will be able to, to perhaps bring some light to that particular question. Um, as an example of what we we'll soon will be in the business of doing, a good colleague of mine, a Hui Vo, who's at, um, in the uh, computer sciences department of City College and at the Graduate Center, uh, does this really amazing IT analysis of something quite mundane to us. It's the, the taxi cab ridership in the city. And there are data sets that now we have now available to us minute by minute of, of taxi cab ridership, where people are picked up, what their routes are, where they're dropped off. And he's developed these amazing tools to take these billions and billions of pieces of data and to interrogate the data set and render it into something we might term a metabolism of a city. This is just the taxi ridership. Now imagine what happens when we tag on to that ridership. Carbon dioxide effluence, okay? Now all of a sudden we know what the carbon metabolism is of the city. It's a little bit like an electroencephalograph or perhaps a cardiogram. And it's interesting, I should have tried to isolate it. The Hurricane Sandy is when the patient went dead and the patient came back to life. And it was really wonderful to see that kind of geophysical uh, stressor, that event, um, articulated in, in taxi ridership data that then we can link to these uh, other uh, variables. Um, another thing that we are going to be working on is something called the exposome. You might think of it as a genome, but the exposure of humans to different um, stressors, um, be it chemical or physical stressors. And that's, that's where these little sensing devices will come in particularly handy, where we can actually track exposure of populations to diff different environmental uh, stress agents. This is a really exciting arena for us because it's truly interdisciplinary. It uh, is a, a consolidation of environmental sciences, chemistry, toxicology, biology, big data system analysis, etc. It's a quintessential urban uh, challenge and it's a quintessential, quintessential interdisciplinary uh, analysis challenge. We're also in the business, in addition to all of this, this um, cutting edge technology, we're also in the business of taking a deep breath and synthesizing existing information. And uh, my work and the work of my team is focused on what I like to call synthesis and community-based activities. One of the things we were able to do is working with the editors of Science Magazine a couple of years back is to stage a series of debates uh, trying to uh, reveal to the readership of Science what are hydrologists and water resource managers thinking about these days? What are they debating about? And they debate about very interesting things. Should we in involve ourselves in investments, billion dollar investments in satellite systems to look at what water is doing on planet Earth? Or should we use these kind of telecommunication revolutionary systems where citizen scientists, for example, could be monitoring the state of the hydrosphere? We also mounted uh, a debate about whether we should be looking at managing water at the local scale, or could we, honest to God, be looking at things over very, very broad 
global domains, plugging our thinking into the globalization of the economy, for example. How can you use the global economy to relieve water stress? And we also were thinking, well, you know, in the 21st century, where energy and capital may be uh, becoming very dear and scarce, maybe we need to look to Mother Nature to help us solve some of our water problems. There was a big debate about whether we should do that in the first place. And this was a very successful series that uh, ran in the summer of uh, 2015. Also, we're in the business of, of catalyzing community-wide activities. Uh, as an example, in the Arctic, uh, we helped to produce a scaling report to the National Science Foundation and other agencies on scale-dependent, here's that word again, scale-dependent analyses in the Arctic research community. Uh, we uh, also, to the National Science Foundation Social Sciences Division, uh, discuss different ways in which we could uh, convey to the public and other stakeholders information about the changing cryosphere. And uh, we are New Yorkers after all, and I just a uh, couple of days before this gathering uh, brought together about uh, 20 people to talk about some of these issues. And uh, I issued uh, for them a, 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 a card, to um, a, a transit card that some of them used to try to get back to Alaska, and it's a pretty far way up north. It's a joke, folks. <laughs> uh, just to talk, just I, I, I'm sl sliding in just a teeny bit of science before the end here. Uh, what was really amazing to me, and, and I just uh, I, I get news reports from the Arctic research community, and what I'm showing you here is this big red blob in the middle. That is a big red blob that uh, was articulated by a, a set of uh, observations and simulation models that for October 2016, just a few days ago, shows this unprecedented outburst of heat in the Arctic. And you can't see the scale there, but I will mention what it is. Relative to the normal climate, at the surface of the Arctic Ocean there, along that red line on the right, eight degrees centigrade, eight degrees centigrade, which is about, what, 15 degrees Fahrenheit, heat anomaly in October of 2018, the end of, the, uh, end of the, the growing season up there, with, of course, big implications on what's going to happen to sea ice and whether it's going to be able to, to persist in years, um, years to come. The other thing that we've been opening um, an avenue of research on is to work with the private sector. And we're working with the bank UBS to try to map out uh, arenas of investment in water science uh, that the private sector might be interested in working with us on. There's our website for those of you who uh, won't be able to make it to the fifth floor, but we certainly uh, invite everyone to, to join us. And I guess at this point I reintroduce uh, Eric. Thanks, Charlie. So now that uh, your interest is peaked, it's now time to select your pathway. Um, all of the initiatives are giving tours at uh, numerous times uh, during the, the next uh, two hours or so. Uh, there's also uh, nanofabrication tours. There's two of those and a Center for Comparison Medicine uh, talk, which will be in the seminar room. And we also encourage you to visit uh, the ASRC info hub in the, in the lobby to learn more about some of the programs that I and others have discussed today. And the poster session will be going on for the next uh, few hours, and there is there is some refreshments, light refreshments in there. So please uh, go and enjoy yourself, and we'll reconvene back here at 520 for those that are interested in the user panel.